Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, my name is Vishwa Satka. I'm an activist in the Climate Justice Charter Movement, and a very warm welcome to all of you um, for attending today's event on Resisting Shell. Uh, we've seen amazing and beautiful mobilization over the past few weeks, and um, that is um, something that we really want to grapple with uh, in this space today. <clears throat> How do we explain this? Um, was this the result of a um, sort of zeitgeist shift? Um, there's greater awareness around the connecting dots between fossil. Was this about um, local organizations that have been kind of trailblazing, uh, kind of getting us all rallied and organized? Um, was it about other organizations giving effective support to get us all mobilized? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this is about injustice, uh, particularly for they have felt um, with the kind of encroachment of this kind of carbon capitalism. So what we're going to do today is unpack <coughs> what is <coughs> what what lies behind all of this. I think the second very important question for us is is what happened. Um, Yes, I mean, we've seen all kinds of mobilization, week-long mobilization. We've seen a May petition from Oceans Not Oil, over 300,000 signatures, I think, Janet, and more maybe. Uh, we've seen legal interventions. Uh, and so a groundswell, if you like, of resistance. And, and so in a sense, is this the turning point? Is this the inflection point that many, many of us have been yearning for? Uh, many of us have been wanting around the connections between the environment, climate, and social justice. So we want to interrogate what happened. We also want to interrogate together, <clears throat> uh, you know, what has been achieved, okay? So we have a power structure in South Africa that's generally impervious to mass resistance, whether it's community-based resistance and so on. Uh, you have a ruling elite that is, is at war with itself, uh, and you really have a crisis of politics at the top. And so what have we really achieved, yeah? and, and what, can we, what can we kind of build on? And lastly, it's the what next question. So all our organizations, many of our activists, including the Climate Justice Movement, rallied, also went back to Parliament this year and it was very clear that Parliament hadn't taken the Charter very seriously, almost two Fish, two sorry, years. can I stop you for and, a second? Um, and basically, Fish? we were sitting with a situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, your What's audio up? is not great, so you're breaking up and people can't hear you. Maybe uh, if you think of switching your video for a minute. Yeah, sure. Okay. Does that help? Does that help? Does that help? It's better. It just says your network bandwidth is low, but, but carry on. So the point is this, is that we went to Parliament and they didn't adopt the Charter, but yet they sent a big delegation to a COP summit. And many of us know that that was a failure. But it's in that context we're grappling with what next. Um, and so we, we're asking this question to all partners, to all forces rallying on the ground, around climate justice and environmental justice. So today, to kind of situate the recent resistance, we have a great lineup of speakers. We have Janet Solomon, producer and director and founder of Oceans Not Oil, and who's been very integral to the kind of mobilization we've seen. We have comrade Insindiso uh, Nongavu, a chairperson of Coastal Links in Port St. John's, who's been very busy rallying small scale fishers uh, and communities. And then we have Poovan Mudli, human rights lawyer at Natural Justice. So we're going to give each of you 15 minutes um, to walk us through some of these issues. And then we're going to have some deep dive debates with those that are participating. So Janet, over to you. Um, I don't know how much history we is needed at this point in time. Um, but obviously, I only became aware of, of the issue of shell on our coastline on the 4th of November, when Daily Dispatch uh, got hold of me um, and wanted a comment. Um, and of course, 
I think to answer some of your questions around how this has happened and why has it happened, um, I think we need to look at the kind of mobilization that's been happening now for probably a year, year and a half, where there has been growing, um, growing networking. Um, behind the scenes, um, contact and, and strong comms on a monthly and sometimes daily basis between various NGOs and organizations um, in WhatsApp groups, also organizing, um, uh, you know, Oceans Not Oil organized a national paddle out um, in response to, to um, uh, you know, we've had a number of, of protest events that we've taken part of and also um, or organized, and we've also had some youth mobilization movements um, where we've approached stakeholders like, like Investec, et cetera, where we've tried to actually um, um, voice uh, protest against their, their investments in, in oil majors and Sassel, et cetera. So there's been a lot of behind the scenes work here. And I think what is, uh, has been growing and, and been getting really exciting is the, the, the standing up and being counted in these spaces from all different sectors. And um, you know, for me, what's been tremendously exciting about all of this is um, it's all shapes, all sizes, all cultural heritage, um, are deeply concerned about this. Um, I'm not sure whether it's just the fact that Shell has, has um, such a big and um, infamous, infamous reputation that has allowed for um, such a fast mobilization from the general public. Um, we're over 430,000 um, on, on our signatures now. Um, that I think dovetailed against your um, traditional fishers rights um, that have just been granted and now seemingly kind of completely stepped over and disregarded. Plus your, your fact that this is a pristine environment that everyone has some kind of um, strong um, emotional attachment to. Um, I think all of these things have dovetailed to create this incredible kind of pop and and uh, really wonderful response. So, um, and I think because there's been so much support amongst the various groups, there's a sense of security or a sense of being more secure when when one steps into a, a space of litigation, uh, proven maybe you can back me up on this or not, but I think there is definitely a sense of being held in the space um, by others and a strong sense of solidarity. So it's been, um, sure, it's been very, very productive and very, very rewarding um, to be in this space at the moment. Um, I'm not going to bore you with details. I think everyone's probably up to speed. I've just heard that that Mantashe has said that he will um, he will oppose the fishers on Friday. I don't know what this means. I don't know if it means that they're going to maybe proven you can give us an idea of of whether he's going to ask for an adjournment or or what's happening there. But that's the latest update that I have, um, and that. DFFE have, have not, they've stepped out. So maybe you can give us more details on that. Um, if you, if there's a need for me to go into greater detail around the, around um, um, this kind of movement, this anti oil in the ocean movement, um, we can do so, but I don't want to, you know, uh, um, bore people with facts that they probably already know. Um, proven? Uh, thanks, thanks, Jen. And Vish, uh, if it's fine for me to continue. Go ahead, Proven. Go ahead. Yeah, just, just to add a few things, and I also don't want to be too long because it would be good to have an interaction and to uh, 
uh, with people on the call today. Uh, you know, Vish, on your point around infection point, I mean, I think it's, it's you know, the people are certainly joining the dots. Uh, I think, um, you know, looking at uh, physically what's happening, you know, to the planet, uh, looking at all of the struggles, uh, you know, collectively across the globe at the moment. Uh, and, you know, I think, you know, as you put it at the beginning, I think what's starting to happen is all of these different issues are all coming together at the same time. So whether it's a race uh, kind of struggles that are going on, issues around, uh, you know, gender-based violence and patriarchy, the environmental, uh, you know, kind of breakdown and the struggles there, it kind of feels like this is certainly the time, uh, you know, when all of that's coming together and it's forcing us to to look it in the face and you know once and for all to 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 deal with this because it's been you know there for centuries the oppression the violence and so on and all of that it feels like it's all seeping up now it also does feel like a point where you know as we are reaching and passing many of the uh, tipping points um you know that that uh, the situation is obviously becoming more desperate more urgent and so on and i think uh, people are feeling that, uh, you know, sense of, of urgency. Uh, I think at the same time, politically, uh, you know, I think there's, uh, you know, more and more people that have lost complete faith and trust uh, in governments and who governments represent. Uh, and I think what's also become clear or clearer to people is, you know, there's little separation between multinational com uh, companies and governments, I think more and more people are starting to see that that reality that it's you know decisions are made um, in dark rooms uh, by very wealthy uh, people, uh, and also I think it's you know the lived reality of uh, you know the inequality issues you know like like in South Africa that's also bringing us to you know a, a tipping point. So it kind of feels like everything's. Uh, coalescing, and I think you know this, the case against uh, Shell uh, is just you know I guess one example where it was ripe for you know all of these different things to uh, you know to to come together. Uh, but also, I think people are starting to see. I mean, just taking South Africa as an example, um, and you know, uh, Gwede Mantashe and others, you know, talk about why is this a big deal and this this has been happening, you know, as if it's never been an issue before. Uh, you know, the, again, you know, if you look at the struggles uh, in Kolobeni or on the west coast of South Africa or in Limpopo uh, in terms of the special economic zone and so on, you know, when you look at the map of all of the extraction that's happened and is proposed, I mean, basically, this country, like this whole continent, is being sucked dry and will be sucked dry in every shape and form, you know, whether it's water, whether it's... Um, sand, uh, you know, uh, forests, etc. you know, they, they are all going and we all know they're going rapidly. So, so in many ways, it, it's, you know, we reach the, it, it, this is the fight of our lives. It, it's for our survival as humanity, as, as, as we all know. And so it does require, require all of us to be more bold. I think what's been really good uh, and, and building on what you said, Janet, to see with the Shell uh, case at the moment is that you know, there's a very different spirit of working that I'm experiencing in terms of, um, uh, you know, let's say organizations, organizations working together, lawyers working together from across organizations, uh, you know, people not worried about, okay, you know, we want to be in the spotlight or, you know, we need money for this, etc. Uh, but, you know, across the board, it, it just feels like everyone's in this irrespective of, you know, um, uh, those things that traditionally organizations used to worry about, you know, and, and you know, the idea of competition, et cetera. I think, you know, that that spirit is is certainly shifting and, and one can see that in, in the shell case. Um, uh, the, the other part, you know, just uh, also uh, in terms of uh, the COP at Glasgow, uh, you know, clearly, you know, over 500 oil and gas people, countries were not prepared to make any commitments, uh, you know, particularly on some of this uh, as part of the formal agreement. Uh, and there was a clear indication that, you know, um, uh, companies and countries uh, are going to accelerate for the next couple of years until, you know, that window is closed. But, you know, 
the destruction will be done by then. And so, you know, this is the fight for our lives and, and, and it has to happen uh, now and it has to happen collectively. You know, the two positive things I took from Glasgow was uh, the fact that people are standing up, which is amazing, but also that uh, there's many organizations and people across the world that are also going to part, uh, you know, around uh, the environment and climate, which is incredible to see, and more and more precedents that are starting to, uh, to emerge. Uh, so then just briefly in terms of the first, uh, you know, case against Shell, uh, the idea was to bring an urgent to, to stop them, our reading, you know, of, of the judgment and, and what happened during the proceedings, uh, because what we were asking for is a return date in court while Shell holds, um, you know, doing the seismic survey so that, you know, evidence can put, be put forward to show that the harm, uh, the judge in the initial case, uh, you know, essentially said that not enough evidence was, was put forward, um, but also said, you know, that process probably wasn't followed uh, you know, by Shell and the government in terms of consultation, in terms of engagement, et cetera. But also, you know, obviously none of the questions around the actual uh, laws and so on uh, in terms of the environment were dealt with uh, you know, at, at, at that stage. So the upcoming case, which is uh, coming up uh, on Friday, um, will deal with the expert testimony that would be put uh, forward uh, in front of the judge to show the harm, but also, you know, legal arguments around how the process was not followed, how this is illegal and goes against our laws and our constitution. And those are the arguments that, that will be made. And, and this uh, case is being brought by several, uh, you know, community members uh, that are uh, directly impacted uh, or will be impacted by, uh, by this. So let me stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Poovin and Janet. Those are excellent insights. Um, do we have uh, Comrade um, um, Incendiso with us? Um, Charles, any? If not, uh, I think we'll just uh, probe some of the issues raised and then uh, hopefully he'll join us and then we'll, we'll open it up for further discussion. So, <clears throat> Charles, while, while you do that sort of background uh, sort of reach, um, I'll just, just facilitate further engagement. So what, what has been the response, the formal response from the state beyond Gwede Mantasha's kind of uh, <coughs> racializing of the issue? Um, has Barbara Creasy responded? Because I know um, Oceans and Oil also engaged with her. Um, and was there a formal response from her? And what, what has been the formal response from, from Mantash beyond what the media has covered? Janet? The first response was that um, we needed to make an appeal. If, if um, based, on, based on the amount of uh, signatories we had, I think we had about 60 or 70,000 signatories at that point, but based on them that um, she was out of the picture due to, due to the whole um, environmental assessment process, she could uh, she was out of it she, you know there was no point in in including her in the petition and we made a very clear decision to do so so because we didn't believe that she could be exempt from this process and we remain that remains our our um contention is that she shouldn't be exempt from this process um uh, and so there was just what this one response to say well then there must be an appeal um, and then the secondary response that we've had from her is just from her department acknowledging letters that we've that we've sent. So that's all that we've received. I'm not sure if others have received anything else. Thanks, Janet. Um, Puvan, any formal responses from the state outside of the legal process that you're aware of? Uh, yeah, as you asked that question, Vish, uh, I just got an email in saying Granny Mantashi has filed uh, uh, an affidavit. So I haven't looked at it, but uh, but just to say, you know, before going to court the first time, um, you know, obviously we wrote to both uh, both the ministers, uh, and, and there's been no response from them. Um, you know, we've tried to, uh, you know, also reach out before the case, etc., and, and there hasn't been a response. Um, 
and uh, yeah, outside of uh, yeah, those, you know, some of these press uh, conferences, etc. So all of that's been you know their response in the media, uh, but certainly no you know kind of direct response to us except now this uh, you know affidavit for, that was filed by him for the upcoming case on Friday. Okay, I mean, clearly his public outburst and and kind of a rendering of all of this as kind of a new apartheid, you know, it's very provocative stuff. But again, he was trying to force a schism. And I just like to know from you both, I mean, uh, how do we counter this uh, sort of racializing, divisive uh, kind of narrative that he's trying to push? Um, and, you know, and, and he's trying to marry it to, to a false dichotomy. So, you know, if we don't have fossil fuels, we can't have the needs of the many met. Um, so, so how do we push back against this and, and build a unifying narrative? Um, I mean, and, and maybe maybe to be a bit, bit more challenging, I mean, do you think that uh, we might want to accentuate the message of climate justice alongside the message of conservation? Um, Janet and Proven? Um, for me, I think what, what's so interesting, and I made this point on radio yesterday or the day before, is that I'd just like to read a little excerpt from Sinagugu Zukulu's um, from the um, Sustaining the Wild Coast. I'd like to read um, part of his application, and I think it will give us context for Mantashe's retorts this week. Um, and it's quite interesting that he's in the space where he's feeling the need to retort. Sinagugu wrote, um, Domestic and international law is increasingly recognizing the rights of these indigenous communities, but Shell's process with regards to the survey enabled by Minister Gwede Mantashe of the Department of Mineral and Resources and Energy has not recognized these rights. Together, Shell and Mantashe are behaving like the colonial and apartheid powers that came before them by not listening to the indigenous communities of the wild coast who have lived in harmony with the ocean for centuries and rely on it for their physical and spiritual well-being. So I accused Mantashe of, of a lack of imagination when he, he, when he just lifted, uh, lifted that and recontextualized it and used it to box, box with activists this last week. Um, you know, it is, it is seemingly ridiculous that he, he uses these terms when the, there's, you know, hundreds of cell phone images and visuals and pictures um, of people all the way along the coast, but especially in these communities uh, coming out. And it, it's just very obvious that this is a kind of decolonial movement. And um, for him to be sort of swinging a bat using these ridiculous terms is, yeah, I think it speaks volumes. Um, and uh, Barry Wigali's article in, in the Daily Maverick was also fascinating, where he also accused Mantasha of hypocrisy, considering that the ANC had, had, has this history of, of fighting oil majors pretty much up until the, up until the Shell House massacre, as it were, where you, you had this kind of shifting happening from, from the fight against the, the, the kind of uh, global waste colonizing oil majors. And then suddenly um, we have Mantasha standing in defense of them. So um, there've been some quite interesting rebuttals. And um, I think this is a really contentious space. I've had so many people get hold of me to say, you know, we've got to respond, we've got to respond, we've got to respond, because they're, this, they're so indignant about um, what Mantasha has said. So, yeah, it's, it makes for interesting times. Uh, just to add a few reflections there, I mean, you know, just thinking uh, during the different kind of struggles, I mean, I remember early on, even before the treatment action campaign came into being, um, you know, when we were challenging the government back then about some of the discrimination that was going on, et cetera, 
you know, the first question they asked was like, you know, who, who are, we, uh, you know, challenging whoever's bringing these issues. Uh, and, you know, the whole treatment action campaign kind of then exploded from, from, from there. Uh, but similarly, you know, when we were challenging the nuclear deal with the Russians, uh, you know, it was similar tactics, trying to attack um, many of us that, that, that were challenging. And, and then, Vish, you'll remember when we camped out outside Treasury uh, and, and then had that massive 30,000 march to Union buildings, um, you know, th there was a whole media campaign and a physical attack on us in the campsite. Uh, you know, because we were challenging what, what was going on at that time. Uh, and what Greta is now doing is, you know, bringing this, um, trying, like you did in Horobeni as well, you know, trying to divide the community there. Now what he's doing is putting this kind of narrative into the public about environmentalists versus local communities, you know, jobs versus, uh, you know, people that are anti-development. And, and that's a whole obviously strategy that that that's uh, you know being used you know i think part of it is you know obviously to counter some of that narrative but i think part of it is is you know not for us to also expend all our energy on greater montage i think you know certainly he has to fall at some point you know if we are to protect our country uh but but i do think uh, you know we need to be really tactical in, in how we uh you know uh, fight fight this fight Thanks, Puvan. Um, we cannot get hold of Comrade Incendiso, uh, but there is a comrade of his, Comrade Carmen, uh, from the Fisher organization, Masi Kundise, who will make a few points just now. But before I bring her in, um, I'd like to just, just uh, provoke a discussion around tactics. So on the one hand, I think the legal track is important and clearly it's strategic litigation and it's, and it's complemented by mass mobilization. On the ground, in terms of the, the kind of protest action we've seen, there has been, I think, some divergent positions. So in the Sunday Times, for instance, the head of the Solidarity Fund was also a small businesswoman, uh, makes the argument that you know, she supports the resistance to the seismic survey. She, of course, has business interests. She owns a lodge on the, on the Wild Coast area. Uh, but she doesn't support the boycott against shell filling stations. Um, her argument was that there are many small business, black business interests in it. Um, so I, I just, I'm just wanting to, to pose the question around how do we build consensus tactics uh, so that we, we keep a mass forces uh, converging, strengthening? But this doesn't mean, of course, lowering the bar uh, in terms of, of what we want. But It'd be nice to hear your views on this. Um, yeah, who wants to go, Janet? Maybe we could include Carmen at this point. Um, yeah, I think I think the the, the two prong approach has to remain one one which is legal and legislative and policy, um, and the other of of mobilization. Sure. Um, with regards to the whole jobs versus anti-development, that argument which is coming into play and which obviously comes into play outside a, a, a shell garage where their jobs on the line should that garage not produce the turnover it's needing. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's a, this is, this is part of the grist and the grind of a, of a transition. This is going to be the grist and the grind of a, of a just transition as, as to how, how we, we manage this, this focus. And it has to be gently done. Um, but I think let's be clear about, well, I had a conversation with Pindile Masangane from Petroleum Agency last week. It wasn't a long conversation because she got up and walked out of the room. But um, in that conversation, she, she believed that 47,000 jobs hung on gas and the development of gas and um, um, that they had produced these 47,000 jobs in the, in the um, I suppose, what could be deemed as the, the gas master plan. 
government's gas master plan. Um, with the shell and seismic surveys um, produce any jobs, yeah, that's highly contentious. Of course, uh, there the are very few jobs except for caterers and helicopter pilots in, in that space. But it's what happens after that. So let's let's look at that space in terms of, let's say they find reserves offshore of, of um, offshore of, of where Amadiba, the community lives. This is a community that has fought mining for decades. And we now have a situation where, according to Masangane, if they find reserves, they're then going to pipe the, that gas straight up onto the shore and then into international gas pipeline network. It's not LNG that they're talking about. They're not going to compress it. They're not going to transport it that way to harbors. They're just going to lay a pipeline and up it comes onto the shoreline. Uh, you know, let's talk about jobs and that transition in that space. And let's look at Agoni land in Nigeria and what gas and, and oil, condensate oils have done in that space. And I think then it puts into context why this fight is so terribly, terribly important um, for our coastline um, and for, for proper jobs, uh, jo clean jobs uh, for the future. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered you correctly because I'm not sure I have all the answers myself. There are probably others better skilled at that answer than me. Should there be a boycott of shell garages? Kuvan, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Vish. Yeah, I mean, just a couple of thoughts and come get you hear your thoughts. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we, we have to look at all of the pressure points. Um, and, you know, part of the strategy has to be a global one, given that Shell is a global company, uh, and, and looking at, you know, the, the connections and all of the, um, uh, you know, areas they, they're operating in. Uh, you know, the case that they lost in uh, May in the Netherlands, where the court has ordered them to reduce their emissions by 40 5% by 2030 is an absolutely vital one. And, and we are looking at, you know, um, what those implications are for new uh, oil and gas projects as an example. But so, so we have to, you know, also uh, complete that whole picture of, of Shell. But going beyond Shell, I mean, it's obviously not just Shell, but it's looking, and we're currently challenging uh, Sassel and any on the same East Coast further, uh, you know, further up where they have been granted license. And as we know, throughout the coastline, you know, uh, Total and many others uh, are in the same situation. So, you know, the key thing is how, how, how do we challenge this collectively? Because it, you know, obviously we want to win this one battle, uh, but, you know, within uh, uh, that, there's, you know, all, all of the other battles that we fought. So we, we need to think strategically around that. Um, I, I think ultimately most companies, you know, feel things when it hurts them. Uh, economically, uh, and you know, based on previous, uh, you know, in the early days of, of shell boycotts and uh, putting pressure on, on, on shell during the apartheid days as well, um, you know, I, I think that's always uh, an incredibly important uh, tactic because you know that that's where they're going to feel uh, you know, feel some kind of uh, challenges uh, as well. I do think the question of, uh, you know, petrol attendance is an important one, and even during protests, uh, you know, there were, uh, you know, uh, many people advised to please support the petrol attendance during this time because, uh, you know, we want to make sure that uh, there, there is obviously income income for them. Uh, in terms of the franchise owners, my sense is, you know, putting uh, pressure uh, at these Shell garages means those owners also need to then put pressure on Shell. Because I, th I think that's an important chain, uh, you know. Like some companies have stopped uh, using Shell, uh, you know, that's going to create some 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 kind of pressure. So, you know, I, I don't think we can run away from uh, from that economic side of uh, you know the protests and um, 
so on. And then I think the point, uh, Patrick, that you made uh, in, in the chat around, you know, also working with the unions, I think is going to be crucially important as, as we go ahead. Exactly. The solidarities are very key with, you know, the petrol attendants on the one hand, and of course, even fisher folk. So I think at this point, I want to bring in Carmen uh, Manarino from Masifundise to say a few words on behalf of, of fisher folk and the struggles they've been waging. Carmen? Thanks. Thanks, Vish. And uh, uh, hello to everyone. It's nice to be here, uh, especially with Janet and uh, Proven. And thanks so, so much for the work that you are doing, also from the legal uh, perspective and try to challenge this uh, uh, survey in court. Um, Anya, uh, Sindizo asked me to say a few words on his behalf, and I think that's uh, uh, where I want to start, in the sense that uh, uh, maybe just going back a, a couple of steps to your previous question, which, um, in terms of uh, uh, Mantasha's comments uh, um, this week. Um, yesterday, um, we published uh, an open letter that was written by the applicant in this uh, second interdict uh, that was really looking at that, these uh, allegations uh, Mantash is making around um, this uh, uh, opposition to Shell being one that is only uh, rooted in uh, white environmentalism and a new kind of apartheid and colonization. And I think it's important to say that uh, fishers have been opposing strongly uh, uh, Operation Fatih and in particular oil and gas uh, um, exploration happening on our coastline uh, very strongly for the last few years. Um, fishers really understand the impact that this will have on their livelihood. And I think that uh, uh, this is often uh, ignored uh, in, uh, in, the, in the discussion, um, especially at, uh, at this high level of the ministry. And indeed, uh, in that open letter, the fishers are really speaking about uh, how this is not just only about livelihood, it's also about uh, customary rights. Customary rights that have been recognized through legal struggles as well that have been taken forward by the fishers. Um, and, uh, and I think that this is also where uh, fishers situate themselves in terms of, you know, um, conservation, pure conservation versus a sustainable use of the ocean. Because indeed for them, it's not about uh, having to not touch the coastline, not to touch what is in the ocean, but it's about a use that can guarantee to them um, that they can continue to um, harvest uh, food uh, and harvest uh, their culture in a way because there is strong connection that they have. So when, uh, uh, when fishers see uh, this kind of development coming to them, um, they are very concerned. And uh, what I think it's also important to say is that uh, um, it's great to see the massive mobilization that is happening against Shah, but it's also important to say that uh, we actually seeing this all along the coastline, number of uh, prospecting applications uh, coming up almost uh, weekly, new applications for oil and gas, new application for mining on the coast. And uh, this is really endangering fishes to the point that they feel that they have been uh, tricked because while they struggled for their recognition and for fishing rights, at the same time now they are having to struggle to, to be able to perform those rights uh, against uh, uh, big multinational corporations. So I think it's uh, really problematic to hear uh, the minister saying that this is uh, all about uh, a new kind, of, well, that the, the um, opposition is uh, a new kind of colonization uh, or apartheid when in fact fishers are saying this is what uh, what we are what is happening in terms of extractivism and profit making that is sort of sought after in the ocean is uh, the whole new continuation of colonization and apartheid extractivism that they have um, fought for years now. So yes, I mean, I, I think that uh, it's really the, the important message that I wanted to bring from Tindiso. Uh, but then I also wanted to add that indeed, um, oh, and with what we are seeing in communities is also that uh, uh, these kind of developments are not bringing uh, any opportunity uh, for communities to actually benefit. I mean, the kind of jobs that are available, it's just cleaning jobs, very, very, uh, uh, low low paid 
jobs. I don't want to say underskilled because there isn't such a thing as a low skilled job, but there is low paid jobs that do not bring any sort of development to communities. And what is only creating these conflicts, because of course there is a lot of big promises that go around with this kind of developments, but what we are seeing is that these promises are not materializing in actual benefits from communities. Um, and it, uh, I think it's very important to highlight. Thanks, Bish. Uh, thank you, Carmen. Uh, that was a very, very important contribution and enriches our conversation here today and collective reflection. Um, just the point that Patrick made as well to sort of amplify it in our discussion. So maybe there's another door that needs to be broken down uh, going forward. Uh, if you do the sort of connecting of dots and you do the political economy analysis, I mean, standing behind Montage and standing behind this carbon criminal state are a very powerful interest and Shell is one of them. But we also have Tebe Investments, um, and we have um, uh, <coughs> Johnny Copeland and the Saktu Investment Company, Hoskins Consolidated, and its, its investments in impact oil and gas. And, and how do we take the fight to them? Uh, how do we, how do we, how do we uh, sort of challenge Kosatu, which has a position on the just transition, um, to kind of confront this, this, this issue? Uh, around Hoskins Consolidated, Impact Gas and Oil, and, and Johnny Copeland. Uh, any thoughts from the panel on that? And then we're going to open this up for, for input from others participate. Uh, yeah, just a few initial thoughts. I, I think, Patrick, absolutely. I think you're on the mark. Uh, you know, this isn't just about Shell, but it, it's, it's looking at the local interests as well, but, but also following the money. Uh, in terms of, you know, who, who's benefiting even behind uh, impact, uh, you know, oil and gas and what the connections are. I, I think there's a lot of uh, work and investigations that, that need to be done there uh, and, and put forward in, into the public domain. Uh, but also, you know, when you see how all of these interconnection plays out uh, in terms of interest in uh, ENCA, the broadcaster, as an example, the link to Johnny Copeland, uh, you know, looking at, uh, you know, how little coverage ENCA has been doing uh, and obviously all of these different ties. I think, uh, you know, being able to join those dots, uh, you know, are, are absolutely crucial. And, you know, certainly I, th I think not enough work has been done yet, uh, you know, with, uh, with the trade unions, Kosatu and, and, and others, uh, you know, in terms of some of the positions and, you know, in terms of, you um, um, just transition, but also I think you know when you look at Gwede Montage's statement, there wasn't a single word there around you know the, the climate crisis or anything. You know all of the stuff leaders have been talking you know a lot about in Glasgow and the need to fundamentally shift. But I think it's also time to take the fight to uh, to the president as well because I think it's time uh, you know he needs to also step into the Janet or Carmen, either one of you want to add? For me, Rich, it's about investment. I mean, it's about, this is all about money. Um, and where few, people's futures sit. So, you know, if you've got investment uh, placed in petroleum going forward, we have to, for pensions or, or you know, your man in the street has to has to review where that his money or her money is 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 being placed, and we have to start changing that conversation around investment, so that so that it's not just a case of of following the money, but just like the shell boycott and what Proven was talking about earlier money talks and we have to start changing that conversation around where where are you putting your money where's our government putting its money um because unless we unless that that environment shifts unless we start putting money safely into the hands of 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 cleaner um cleaner corporations that are more ethical um more just 
this is just going to keep going round and round and round because the money will just shift from one space to another, one investment space to another. So for me, it's also, it comes from all angles where there's these there's conversations about Shell and where their money is coming from, but also we have responsibility too as to, to where and how we invest and where and how um, our pension schemes and our, our monies are, are, are deeply rooted in, in oil and gas too. And, and, and that needs, that needs a, a divestment and a mass, a mass divestment too. Um, you know, I, I think that's, that's important. And yes, of course, it, 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 that's, for the, that's for those that, that have access to these, these services. Um, and the rest of us can also boycott, you know. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's time to put pressure on government to, to, to put its money where it's, its mouth is in, t in terms of its own investments and, and these political parties too. I've been deeply, we had, you know, when we had, I think about 200,000 signatures, I had one political party say, mm, yeah, you know, we also, we too, we object as well. And I thought, this is so ridiculous. Why does one have to wait for tens of thousands of signatures before a political party steps into the fray? You know, we've just had, we've just had elections. I really battled with elections to find anyone's green policies. Um, you know, uh, these things should be top of mind. We should be able to say, okay, well, this, this, this political party believes this, 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 and this. But it's a really hard thing to say, um, to say what the environmental uh, belief structure and policy actually is. Um, and do they walk the talk? And where do they invest? And these are, these are the kinds of questions that we've also got to ask our political parties and our leaders too. I'm starting to rant, so I'm gonna switch. <laughs> Thanks, Janet. That's very welcome. Uh, Carmen, any, any comments uh, around taking the fight to the investment uh, companies and so on, standing behind this? Um, Yes, maybe just to add a couple of words to what Janet said, which I agree with. I think it's uh, uh, from, from where we stand and working with rural communities, fishing communities, I think that um, that's where we still to see the important need to build majorities and alliances with others, because uh, uh, it's very difficult for fishing communities to be able to navigate um, everything that happens in the black box, right? They see a name, they see a show. But how does Shell get to the point where they can uh, do this, uh, this kind of uh, action? Um, it's through investments and who funds Shell. So I, I think that that's where um, creating a, a space of information sharing and uh, being able to then also build uh, majorities and uh, coordination and collective struggles becomes very important. Um, it, I think it's very important to unpack who is behind Shell and what interests are involved there, because there is interest for political parties, there is interest of individuals, um, and I think that there is uh, interest that also go beyond the political party and look at the state. I mean, uh, um, I think that it's very important to say that uh, um, other parties that might be saying they have a different stance. Uh, in reality, we see them uh, uh, supporting this uh, kind of uh, developments also, for example, in the Western Cape, very much so. So, um, um, yes, I think that that's where we need to create connection in way, and then that's where the, the job of those that are investigating this uh, uh, black box, what's in the black box becomes very important. Thank you, Carmen. So, um, before I open it up to people, just to say, I mean, this point about uh, the lack of uh, institutional politics around uh, environmental justice, climate issues, etc., is a gaping hole in the South African political situation. Uh, we issued a critique of all parties contesting the local government election, at least the big three, and highlighted how vacuous they were in terms of climate issues, uh, just transition thinking, uh, and, and more generally environmental issues. Um, and so, you know, there's a real, real crisis at that level. And hence, in our strategy document, um, which we just developed collectively, 
we're talking about 2024 being a climate justice election in South Africa. Now we haven't figured out what that means, but we're putting that into the conversation and we'll actually share that document also in the chat group. So keeping that in mind, I'm going to open up this discussion uh, for a few minutes just to get some feedback um, from some of the attendees around how they, they see this discussion and try and focus your, your, your inputs around what next. I mean, how do we amplify the struggle? How do we scale it up? How do we build the solidarities um, that, 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 are, that need to be engendered? Because there's also contradictions here uh, that we need to manage collectively. So uh, who would like to go? Uh, there's some hands here. Um, Laurie Coogan, please not too long, um, just a few minutes, at least two minutes. Go ahead, Laurie. Uh, I don't know if you can enable this, um, Charles. Charles, are you there? Or is it a one day? Who's, who's running this, who's hosting this event? It's a one day now because Charles one has been dropped yeah. off. Okay. Okay, can, can, can you enable Laurie Coogan to speak, please? Will do. Thank you. Okay, Laurie, enable you, you can speak. Okay, right, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm listening to you and I, hear exactly what you're saying. Um, I am an environmental scientist as, and I'm also part of the DA and I'm passionate <laughs> of getting this kind of dialogue going. And I was hoping to even push that harder in whatever capacity I am involved. Mm -hmm. I have been involved in the Biodiversity United Nations uh, 2020, 2013 um, talks. And I feel that we need to make this more, um, the, the talk of sirens, of having it on the bridge, people need to have it in their face. And I really think it's a thing of a focus of having to do that, then going back to NEMA and saying, if it hasn't been done, and Barbara Creasy, we know she has been faithful since 1976, but her training is not in environmental science. She is a steward of her government and an experienced and hardworking one, but her initial, her training, as I said, is more political. She has an honors in political science and then went on to more a uh, master's the ANC paid for, but that was more in um, governance. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is I think sometimes it's critical to have a partnership between government and civil society. And civil society has the ability to be able to say things and to do things and brings an incredible expertise and experience that is often not there in government. And I think we need to be looking at really active partnerships and some goals. And I would love to be involved because I believe it's really important um, like what is happening here that people are actually getting active in it. Um, my own daughter is actually involved with the mining on the West Coast. I'm giving my age away uh, in trying to stop that. And I'm, you know, my concern is once you get rid of it, once you've done the damage, do, can we ever justify it in any way? It's like a short term enrichment, so unsustainable. And yet, as you said, we go to COP26, we say we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But we need to really have people who are top of their game actively involved in these negotiations, in holding people accountable, in making sure we have the right policies and not being shut out. So Thanks. that's why I'm saying that from my point of view, I'm so glad that we've got such an action from civic society about this. And I'm sending it to people I shouldn't be even sending it to and every group and whoever I can think of because I just think it's really important to stand up and say, you know what, enough is enough. Is there any real long-lasting social benefit for decimating what is really a place that has got sustainable livelihood, amazing ecotourism? And, you know, we need to think long-term. We need to think sustainable. We have got an incredible Thank country. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I bring in the panel, I, I just want to amplify a few points that were made in the chat. Um, there's this, this debate, I think, that we are having here around um, the petrol stations, the garages. And, and some are arguing that there's, they, there's a need to press this button. Um, but again, we've got to be careful about solidarities with petrol attendants so they are not hurt. Uh, the role of trade unions in building the solidarity becomes very, very important. There was another point made about, uh, you know, ask these garages to, to withdraw from support uh, for shell extractivism. And, um, and so flip the narrative. There was another point made about insurance. Um, <laughs> harking back to July this year, the infamous moment in our democracy. And, um, and we saw the looting and the destruction, but there seemed to be public infrastructure insurance against rioting, et cetera. I don't think the person's arguing for rioting and burning down garages, but they're making a point that you can draw down resources. So there's that one issue. The other issue was Matthew Cherish making the point about VITS and it having relationships with Shell, and I'm sure it's other higher education institutions as well. And um, what else? And then Zico Tamela makes a very, very important point. Trade union federations and their affiliates should be engaged for support. This should be done formally. I think this is a very, very important contribution uh, to, this, to this engagement today and debate. Uh, let's, let's hear from the panel. Um, Janet, you can go and then Carmen and then Puvan. Janet? And um, yeah, sure. I just wanted to respond to Laurie with regard to um, wanting to engage Barbara Creasy in this, in this whole fray. Right now, we can't. And this is, this is the fundamentals around this entire debate, is that the Department of Environment is exempt from this whole thing. That is the orchestration that happened when the one environment, just prior to the one environmental plan, when all the legislation fell out of, you know, South African law. We talk about, you talk about wonderful skills, and I totally agree with you. There are so many thousands, hundreds and thousands of people that have something to say about this, and a lot of it really, really legitimate. But I'm afraid government's not listening. And this is another big, big issue here, is that the public participation process for environmental assessment in South Africa is broken. It's broken because you haven't got, you haven't got a situation where the Department of Environment has enough power, quite simply. Mining, mining overrules all, and mining has the biggest say. And until that changes, and I think this is where these cases, um, no pressure proven, but this is where these cases become so fundamental, is that they might be able to make some way in shifting that dynamic um, and, and, and engaging this whole systemic failure to actually hold the people of the wild coast and hold their customary rights, hold their traditions, hold their tangible and intangible heritage, along with the rest of us. Um, and yeah, I, it's, a, it's, it's a huge systemic flaw. Uh, with regard to engaging the trade unions, um, I'm up for it. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is an, a very important discussion that needs to be had. I know that there have been attempts by government to try and engage unions with regard to, to gas jobs and gas development. Um, and I think this, this whole discussion around a just transition, you know, a just transition from coal to gas to renewables, it, uh, for me, it's, it's, there's a lack of logic in this, but, um, you know, maybe it's, it's cases of geography as well. But I think the problem is that none of that is really being fleshed out. Show me the just transition documents from, from government. Show me government's real engagements um, with the, the issue of just, tra a tr a just transition. I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing it and I'm looking hard and I'm just not seeing it. So 
um, I think it's an important thing that the trade unions get get involved and we can flesh out who belongs where, how, how are we going to do this, how are we going to move this country forward to keep jobs, not only keep jobs, but develop more jobs and clean jobs and good jobs and dignified jobs. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Carmen? Yes, uh, I will add on this point around the trade unions. Uh, I think that uh, uh, trade unions are extremely important uh, in the, the struggle for uh, uh, climate justice, uh, for a just transition. Um, they, they are those that really have the power to put pressure uh, on uh, capital and to put pressure on governments. Um, they can, they, uh, I strongly believe that while uh, we organize fishing communities, um, we, we also need uh, those that are in trade unions to, to be on, on our side. Um, and I think that that's also where the difficult conversations needs to happen. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's not easy to engage in those conversations sometimes, but it's possible. Uh, we have been seeing it happening more and more, and we have to continue to build on that because, uh, again, it's about how do we build a majority that can put pressure not just on government, but also on companies to uh, change, uh, change uh, the way we sort of think about future and energy um, in this country. So uh, absolutely, I think that bringing uh, the trade union into these fights, uh, it's of paramount importance. Thanks, Fish. Thank you, Carmen. Um, uh, Puvan? Yeah, just to add a few things. I mean, starting with uh, Mr. Barbara Creasy, I think, uh, you know, the bottom line is if, if your portfolio is environment and fisheries, uh, this has got everything to do with you. You can't pass the buck and say, according to the law, it's somebody else's problem. Uh, so, I mean, that's a dereliction of responsibility as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the two is, you know, the fact that, you know, there are processes that need to be followed. So, you know, contacting interested and affected parties is part of our law. Uh, you know, having proper environmental authorizations is part of our law. But what we see is that, you know, um, government officials will do everything in their power to do the very minimal, like put a small advert in a, in a newspaper as an example, as opposed to proactively reaching out, you know, to communities that would actually be affected. Uh, and, and so, you know, you may have certain basic things in place, but, uh, you know, these are not implemented properly because there's a very specific agenda and it's to try and um, quietly do things. And, you know, while we were all locked down during COVID and all of the other restrictions, the bottom line is these permissions were being granted, you know, uh, no proper consultations were happening. And these companies just continue to do whatever they do. So, you know, our rights are being restricted, you know, while companies can do whatever they do. But also Gwede Mantashe, you know, in his press statement, uh, in a very perverse way, spoke about Section 24. Uh, and how that allows you to do a whole lot of things as long as, you know, you take some precautions. Uh, and, and, you know, for us, uh, you know, that Section 24 is so important, uh, like it is in, in many constitutions, uh, you know, in, in terms of looking at uh, our right to a healthy environment. And recently, the UN Human Rights Commission uh, passed a resolution recognizing the right to a healthy environment as a human right in itself, uh, you know, which is a massive thing uh, globally, but you know, obviously, even with the you know amazing constitution we have, uh, you know, governments trying to get around uh, you know some 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 of these uh, uh, these clauses, uh, and then you know, uh, Laurie mentioned the um, the West Coast, uh, you know, having spent time there, having sneaked into uh, into looking at that mining operation uh, there, it's horrific what's going on. Um, you know, beaches being dug up, the waste going directly back into the ocean, government giving, you know, further permission to do more uh, kind of exploitation. And, you know, and, and, and that's why going back to the point around, you know, mobilization and so on, absolutely, I think the trade unions, are, you know, absolutely crucial because, you know, again and again, government will talk about, uh, you know, economics, jobs and so on, when in fact, a lot of this is just being extracted, including the money. Thank you, Puvan. 
So there are a couple of comments coming through. Um, I mean, I think there's general support for engaging trade unions. Um, Matthew makes the point about Shell in Observatory Cape Town um, changing the signage. Um, and so, you know, there's room for engagement directly with Shell garages in communities and so on. And I think it's a very interesting rallying point, given that not everybody's living at the coast, et cetera. But, but, but how do you get that politics right? Um, there's also another point about, um, you know, using the climate science and, of course, the carbon budget by Judy Scott Goldman. Um, I don't know. I mean, this, this, this issue is, is really where, where I think the frontier of climate litigation is. I mean, can we use climate science, climate budgets um, to push back? Um, and maybe, maybe some <clears throat> international comparative examples would be useful here, Puban. Um, Kathy Brooks makes the point is anyone engaging with <coughs> Shell fuel stations? If yes, how are you approaching them and what are their responses? Um, so yeah, let's just get some feedback on that for now. Um, yeah, anybody, Puvan, you wanna go? Uh, yeah, and maybe just to touch on the point Kathy raised as well. Uh, it, it was in fact, uh, there will be any case uh, where the court said you have to have free prior informed consent and there has to be, uh, you know, actual uh, engagement, uh, you know, with communities before, uh, you know, any of these uh, projects can, uh, can, can start. So, uh, and it's the same community as well that's at the forefront of, of this, uh, with Shell as well. Uh, and just in terms of, you know, some, some of the development uh, you know, there's been some of you would have seen, uh, you know, a lot of pressure in the UK uh, to, uh, you know, stop stop some of the operations there in terms of Shell and, and, and some successes there. But also, I think, you know, what what's starting to emerge uh, globally uh, is, you know, a lot of divestment type of campaigning that's, you know, uh, had had a lot of successes uh, as well. But also a lot of precedents that certainly have been set. Um, and precedents that look both at, uh, so uh, a case in Colombia, not so long ago, Fuchs case, uh, you know, that very, looked very much at the interrelationship between people and their rights and the environment where you know, the communities in Colombia were trying to stop the loggers and others from destroying, you know, parts, uh, parts of the Amazon. And I think that's something for us to look at because it is that kind of interconnection. And, you know, anyone you speak to from Morobeni, we talk about, you know, that you can't separate the land from the ocean. You can't, you can't separate the people, uh, you know, from, from nature. This is, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I think more and more traditional knowledge and indigenous wisdom is starting to emerge from across the globe. And as indigenous communities are coming more under attack, um, you know, uh, more of that knowledge is coming, uh, coming forward about, um, you know, the, the, the why we need to do this uh, and, and how we need to do this and, and how we give sustainable thing. Thank you, Proven. Um, anybody else, uh, Carmen or, or Janet, want to respond to anything? On the garages? I mean, I don't know, the fisher folk are. Janet, you want to say something? Sorry, I didn't hear any of that. Uvesh, sorry. This issue of garages, shell garages, and engaging them um, in the sort of mobilizing work that some of you might be involved in, are there conversations going on around how uh, you orchestrate this? Um, do you engage the owners? Do you engage the workers? Um, uh, you know, what are the grassroots mobilizing strategies around these garages that are coming to the fore? I think I think there's a yearning in the in the wider chat to just kind of wrap our heads around this. Um, certainly, obviously, the protests are are are, are gentle protests, um, and there have been discussions. I mean, there's the the groups have been quite. Um, buzzing with the kinds of conversations that are, are being had. Uh, the recommendation by some is that you, you go into Shell and you, you buy from the store 
um, you tip an attendant and you and you leave. You don't buy the the hydrocarbons from them, um, and that is a statement in itself. Um, but yeah, I think I think it is an an important one in terms of of how do you deal with the people involved. Um, you know, I've had this discussion all the way along. It's like the ESCOM discussion, the, the coal discussion. How do we get people to to move from 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 jobs that are, are are paying for food on the table to a clean job? The issue, of course, is that there is a, a lack of political will to provide those jobs at the moment, and it's not like they're a dime a dozen. They should be, but they're not. Um, you know, we know that renewables could get hands very busy, but then, you know, the 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 role, the bulk, the, the government's mobilization around re renewables has been scant um, and uh, deeply problematic. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I think it's a it's it's a, a humane thing of trying to kind of recognize somebody's rights, maybe tip the guy, uh, but but you know, don't acknowledge the the hydrocarbons that are there. That's just some of the simple stuff that's come out of what we've been doing. Thanks, Janet. A comment? And yes, we'll, bring, uh, we'll bring in Cindy so now as well. After okay. You. No, that's great because I was going to say, um, I think that Cindy so can speak to this. I, I, I do think that it's uh, very hard to, to balance uh, between, uh, you know, people that make their living uh, working at uh, uh, shower powers, uh, well, um, petrol station, Versus the need to put to again, they try to put pressure everywhere we can in this uh, the struggle. So I know that uh, the fishers in uh, Post and Jones, for example, have actually been engaging uh, taxi associations to um, to convince them to also uh, enjoy uh, uh, join uh, the boycott to show. Uh, but yes, I think that it's uh, it's it's not an easy answer, and that's uh, that's the, the issue. I mean, it's not a zero sum game, uh, not uh, at the beginning at least. Um, so it's uh, it's important to to engage with the issue, but it's also important to acknowledge that uh, um, something is gonna give in uh, in, uh, in the struggle and uh, trying to. Uh, put pressure it becomes uh, very important, especially when uh, uh, the legal routes might fail or the uh, advocacy routes with government uh, uh, can can also fail. Uh, but yes, I would love for Sindiso to speak more to this. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. Carmen I Sindiso just joined us. We think um, I'm trying to find him, and uh, can we give him speaking rights? He's one of it's, the leaders uh, the of course it's uh, the the phone number uh, the oh, it's, it's the phone number yes mm. uh, uh one day the phone number amongst attendees is comrade Sindiso. can you please give him talking rights comrade Sindiso, we'd like you to input thank you for joining us you know we know you had some technical difficulties comrade can you hear us Unfortunately, I'm trying to unmute the mic, but it's not. It's not unmuting. Oh, no, there it is. Okay. Comrade, in... Comrade Incendiso, can you hear us? Are you able to unmute on your, uh, on your end? Oh, that's a pity. Um, I think we're having a, a technical problem. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, we have two hands up and let's just take short inputs, one from Alice Thompson and the other from DJ J, and then we're gonna wrap up. Okay, Alice, go ahead. Alice? Okay, hold on. I think Sadiso has been managed to unmute. Uh, Sadiso, are you able to speak? Comrade Sadiso? Yes, I'm, I'm able oh, to, to talk. Oh, wonderful. Yes, go ahead and give us your, your input on this role of small-scale fishers in the struggle. Yes, um, uh, first, I, I want to greet all the leaders that we have been here. Um, 
in in our area we do mobilizing the the the, the some of, of watch and and the fishing communities as well because we 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 we, we believe that if there is, is anything that can continue with shell the marine life is destroyed now we we we, we are on the process that we, we, we can stay in with, with the Texas Association in, in Boston George. And our meeting yesterday, it was successful, but we, we, we were awaiting the, 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 the outcome conversation with, with them. Now we, we hope that if the Texas because as I said, they, 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 they cannot buy the fuel in the shell garage. They, 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 they can feel the pressure. Thank you. Thank you, comrade, for joining us and for sharing that. Um, we want to wrap up. Uh, we'll give Alice Thompson uh, two minutes to say something and DJJ. Alice, do you want to come in? Can you unmute? I wonder, I think she's having difficulties. I wonder. She uh, should be able to, yeah. yeah Alice, you have uh, those, uh, yeah. Hi. Yes, so uh, um, the one thing is if, if we boycott Shell, um, Shell needs to know that we're boycotting them and why. Um, so, I mean, the one option is for people to write or email Shell. But then I thought another option would be to have a petition that's actually a pledge. So when you sign the, the petition, you, you you make a pledge to, to boycott Shell. Um, but then, I mean, the other issue is that, um, you know, BP actually also gets its fuel from Shell. Shell is actually a, a fuel fuel supplier. Um, mm. And uh, a friend also said that Caltex gets its fuel from Shell. I'm not sure whether, you know, I haven't been able to verify these. Um, so, you know, that's another issue we would we would need to look into. Um, we, yeah. So mm. going to BP, you definitely, you know, separate refinery is BP and Shell. So, um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to add. Thanks. Thank you, Alice. That's very valuable. I mean, that that forces us to really do more research, uh, in-depth research, to really understand the political economy here, because we might be shooting ourselves in the foot uh, if we step up and say, well, boycott Shell, but really it's a major supplier in the South African context. Okay, DJ J, let's hear you. Uh, DJ J, you can unmute. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so I, I'm actually organizing with uh, Extinction Rebellion in Cape Town, and we've recently put out a press release um, uh, that was signed on by multiple social, environmental, and community-based organizations, um, including Oceans Not Oil. And we, we spoke to a few of these issues that have been highlighted today, and so I just want to highlight a few of them. Um, the, the issue on jobs is a very interesting one because um, currently, you know, there's a lot of uh, countries, for example, in the US, where renewables employ more people than coal, oil, and gas combined. Um, and so the question is, how many jobs would, would we actually expect to, um, to generate? And who, who can they go to? Who can fill those jobs? Um, do, do people actually benefit within the areas in the country? Um, or will a lot of these jobs be fulfilled from elsewhere? Um, so that's the one issue. And then we can also start talking about um, you know, the, the concept of stranded assets. Uh, do we want to build an entire industry um, and um, base a large portion of our economy on um, industries that we know essentially we have to phase out if, if we want to have a livable plant? Um, there's, an, there's an IEA report um, on achieving net zero emissions by 2050, which is what we know we need to do to have a, a two thirds chance of, of uh, achieving or limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. And um, that IA report says that there's no new oil and gas needed beyond what has already been discovered. So the reserves we currently have. 
Um, we don't need to actually explore for any more. Um, and so when you combine that with uh, the, the concept that, you know, if we build out, um, anyone building out this and any industry based on fossil fuels is likely building a white elephant um, for in the next couple of years, how long will those jobs be around? For? It really would be a shorter term benefit um, with many, many um, short, medium and long term um, costs. Uh, and then we couple that with the history of, of these companies um, all over the world. Um, I mean, close to home, it, the, the, the example of the Niger Delta was brought up, but they really have a very bad uh, history of operating in a, a social, socio-environmentally safe manner. And so we have to just oppose that to the potential impact on other industries, um, as well as livelihoods, direct livelihoods for people who aren't you know, necessarily involved directly in the industry, but are doing this for, for their livelihoods. Um, and then this is where the, the issue of the, of the just transition really does come into play. Um, you know, if, if, we're, if we're thinking long-term and we're building these strategies on, on how we're gonna um, focus certain areas of our, our economy and growing certain areas of our economy, we need to be, uh, the, the just transition has to be the center of that conversation. And while we are seeing some of that happen, you know, with the Presidential Climate Change Coordinating Commission, and we have um, a lot of organizations trying together with the just transition charter, we're not really seeing the kind of um, forward thinking and planning and movement on this by government. Um, and, and we really, really do need to have these conversations now. So we don't build white elephants and we don't put a lot of effort into um, setting up these industries that ultimately we, we can't have um, if we want to live on a livable planet. And um, the, the climate change itself is such a, an intersectional issue which is why climate justice is, you know, has brought so many different people together from all different uh, organizations and, and walks of life um, with that we really need to take it seriously. So we need to ask ourselves with all these issues um, you know, around, around doing this and all the opposition, why is this still happening? Why is it something that's even under consideration? Um, and, and then the lastly, just to close up is mm. um, the, we've globally seen an inaction and insufficient action on, on, on climate and climate justice from governments everywhere. And I mean, there's multiple reasons for this, but um, what it means is that we, we need to focus our efforts on, on civic action um, in building like a grassroots movements uh, along all the, the, the uh, portions of, of climate justice. Um, so we can force the public pressure for governments to, to, do, to do something uh, and to do the, the right things and to act at the speed and scale needed. And then we'll, we, what we also see more and more is governments and um, being taken to court by their people uh, because they're actually, unfortunately, not operating with the best interests of the people at hand um, for, for various reasons. And so we're seeing this more and more where ordinary people are taking their governments to court and, and saying, um, you're, you know, you're not doing what you need to be doing. And maybe we need, we need to see more of that. And we are just beginning to see that, for example, with the cancel coal, coal case um, that the Center for Environmental Rights has brought forward. Um, and yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of that happening. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to give each panelist sort of 30 seconds to make a closing comment. Janet, do you want to go? Unmute. Sure. Um, I just wanted to thank you, DJ. Um, I also wanted to just respond to your shooting ourselves in the foot with regard to Shell. Um, at some stage, we're going to have to shoot ourselves in the foot with regard to hydrocarbons. Um, sanctions hit us. I'm old enough and ugly enough to have understood sanctions. I grew up with sanctions. I know what sanctions did. Part of our legacy with sanctions was Cecil. Um, I don't want to kind of focus on that so much as the strengths that South Africa has in terms of, of skill sets um, and imagination and a real kind of ballsy get out, get down, roll the sleeves up and get something done. Um, and maybe it is time to start shooting ourselves in the foot and changing, changing, physically changing mindsets in the sense of actually getting work done on the whole renewable idea um, and, and, and changing how we work. So um, I don't know, I'm a radical. So I would say starvation diet, you know, uh, let's start starving and see what comes from starving ourselves of hydrocarbons. Um, because I think as soon as we do, there'll be some crazy imaginative and really exciting thinking that, that comes from it. 
I, it's a sort of silly idea, but I think these are ideas that we need to plant is the idea that we have to stop using hydrocarbons at some stage in the, in the very near future. Excellent. Well, uh, uh, Carmen? Um, thanks. Um, I think maybe just in closing, what I think is important to say is uh, I agree that uh, indeed we, we have to look at uh, the situation and uh, ask ourselves realistically how do we continue to mobilize and how do we continue to build a uh, consensus uh, among citizens and workers and uh, fishing community, bringing everyone into the picture because indeed um, I think a starvation diet might be necessary. This is transition will not be simple, but I think that what we are seeing uh, with uh, the mobilization on Shell, it's, uh, it's very promising in terms of uh, how we can build on, uh, on one case, but importantly, it's important to also understand that uh, indeed the, the seismic surveys, what is happening with Shell is only one case. This is happening all over the coast, offshore, inshore, um, in the Northern Cape with Osako, uh, on the West Coast with the mining. And uh, that's where we need to continue to build understanding that it's not just about uh, one case and one company, but it's about a uh, development model that is uh, uh, in front of us and that we have to challenge at the core. Thanks. Thank you, Carmen. Excellent. Uh, Puvan? Uh, yeah, I know we're out of time, but just two very brief points to finish. I think one is to know that on the legal side, we're going to take this to the end, um, to whether it gets to the constitutional court uh, and, and, you know, challenge there, uh, you know, a, a collective of lawyers are certainly going to take this uh, to, to, to its conclusion. Uh, but just to say that that mobilization is absolutely crucial, even with these cases that are going on, and the next case will be heard on Friday. Uh, and I do think it's important to step up uh, and keep that mobilization and momentum going because that plays a massive, massive role. Uh, and then the last thing to say, you know, I think the key thing about what's happening at the moment is people from all walks of life are coming in and doing whatever contribution they can make. You know, so whether it's musicians, comedians, uh, you know, grannies. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, you know, people from all walks of life. And, and that has to be the spirit. It's not about, you know, a few organizations that are leading, et cetera. That's not the case. It, it is about, you know, so when people ask, um, you know, uh, is anyone engaging with the Shell franchises? It, it, you know, asking ourselves the questions, uh, you know, can we engage with the Shell franchises so that it's a collective struggle? Thank you for that. Um, I think we must uh, say a big thank you to everybody on the panel uh, for their efforts, their hard work, and their activism around the sort of anti-shell resistance, as well as everybody who attended. Uh, it's all very, very inspiring, comrades. Um, it's breaking new ground for us. It's opening up new possibilities, which is what's very, very exciting, and which we started interrogating in, in this conversation. This is one of the objectives of why we wanted this, this meeting, to have this collective rigorous uh, engagement around these issues. Now, <clears throat> it's clear that the, mobile, the legal uh, <coughs> challenge is very, very important. And again, this might break important ground for all of us. December 17th, Esther Romani puts in the details here, Gramstown, Makanda, uh, rally comrades. Let's rally to, to the Fisher folks. Uh, around December 17th, let's get onto social media, let's get onto our organizational platforms, public platforms, and draw attention to December 17th and the hearing that's happening in Makanda. I think that's very, very crucial for this conversation today. I think the other very, very important contribution that's been made is that we got to start extending the struggle, okay? So we heard that SETSI is now going to be, and it has for a very, very long time, been fighting SAPREF. And I think it's important that we make that connection in the struggle uh, right now. Um, there's potential for us to actually extend beyond this uh, to also uh, connect with trade unions uh, more generally, uh, to have those formal engagements, to have those sit down engagements around the just transition, around the current struggles, and how do we build solidarities. And I think this is all very, very, very important. And it's come out of this conversation. 
um, I think there was some nuancing around tactics, and I think that's important. Um, I mean, should the demand be made to shell garages that they convert into electrical mass uh, vehicle or mass transport charging stations, okay? So to kind of inspire the imagination now, uh, if these are going to be stranded assets, uh, if this is not part of our future, maybe this is something that ga garage attendants, trade unions and so on can see as a possibility. Uh, we need a renewable energy infrastructure for mass-based public transport in this country. And maybe the time has come to talk about the conversion of garages uh, in the context of the struggle. In addition to everything else, uh, symbolic shifts that we want to achieve, uh, name changing, uh, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> I think what's also very, very crucial in this conversation is that we, I think we, we've come to understand that there are various forces uh, that are standing up here um, that are converging. But we do need to take this to the next level. We do need to think about how do we build active solidarities, convergences beyond this moment. Because these moments come and go, comrades. Uh, these are conjunctural moments. They fizzle out. Uh, but how do we go beyond that kind of, uh, that, that, that kind of transients? Um, where it flickers and it dies. And I think this is a question we haven't fully answered, but it's something we need to all grapple with and think about. There's momentum on this front, there's momentum on other fronts as well of the climate struggle. And, and we need to think about how we, we kind of bring all of this together. I think the other very, very important point uh, that comes out in this conversation is that we do have an institutional political crisis in South Africa. We don't have uh, a political forces in the political system that genuinely take environment seriously, that genuinely take the climate crisis seriously. So you have a power structure uh, that is firmly against us. Uh, the ruling party, as we identified in this conversation, stands to benefit uh, from the Shell transaction, but a whole set of other transactions as well. It's literally expanding and reproducing the minerals energy complex. And it's been doing that since 1994. So it's not new, it's not a surprise to us. Uh, we know about Madupi, we know about Kusile, we know about the transactional politics. So you actually have a carbon politics in South Africa that's <coughs> deeply entrenched in the mainstream. And how do we displace that is a very, very fundamental political and strategic question. Is it gonna be enough for us to win one or two legal victories along the way, but yet the trajectory and the juggernaut is moving towards reproduction of this uh, life destruction, life destroying system. So we really, really have to grapple with that question. And again, um, in our strategy document, we are saying, um, yes, let's build movement, let's converge, let's let's build mass power, let's struggle on all these fronts, but also let's let's think about 2024 differently. We've got to realign forces in South Africa. And if the anti-shell resistance is anything to go by, if it's an index, if it's an indicator of a shift in consciousness, then the time is now. Uh, the politics uh, for the deep just transition is now. So thank you to everybody for making the time, for participating. Uh, all your contributions have been extremely valuable and welcome. And we're looking forward to working with all of you next year to deepen these struggles. Have a lovely break, comrades. Recharge, and let's take up the fight next year. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye.